Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor, professional photographer, Sony Alpha Ambassador and Adobe Ambassador for Australia. I want to take you on a little journey that many photographers go on when they're moving from stills only capture to capturing movies for uh, projects that they're working on. Okay, this will include some useful tips and techniques that many photographers learn along the way. Okay, first I'd like to show you a movie that I captured uh, when I was first transitioning into uh, movie making. It was all constructed or uh, assembled using Photoshop CC and just a, um, a budget entry level DSLR. Okay, so you can uh, pick this up uh, by following the link below. Okay, or I'll just uh, play this 30 second movie now. Okay, so some of the uh, techniques I was using there is if the subject matter is still, uh, then we're forced into moving the camera to create some sort of dramatic experience for the viewer. Um, this is uh, another movie that I've captured for uh, UNICEF in Australia, uh, which is a project uh, run by a Sony uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Unit, um, working with uh, young Indigenous children, uh, giving them uh, Sony cameras and getting them to help tell their own story. Okay, this uh, I was shooting actually, um, actually stills and movie footage at the same time, and this is what I assembled again. Uh, this is only a couple of minutes long, but was assembled all inside of uh, Photoshop. Okay, so that was a bit of a fun project there, and as I say, uh, completely assembled inside of Photoshop. 
Okay, so obviously Premiere Pro and Final Cut Pro are the professional tools, but it's amazing what you can actually put together uh, using the, uh, the tools, the post-production tools you're already uh, partially familiar with. Okay, so uh, this next uh, um, slide is talking about perhaps uh, the next camera that you purchase. Uh, most uh, cameras these days, even the entry-level DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, are really uh, excellent at capturing high-quality stills. Uh, but um, movie making uh, is a bit of a mixed bag for uh, these cameras. Uh, some of them are, have very high-quality uh, movie recording capability, where some of them uh, are left a little bit wanting. Uh, so, so the, these next seven features is maybe what you put on your shopping list when choosing your next uh, stills camera uh, that can also capture high quality video. The video world is quite quickly moving into 4K capture, uh, not just 1080 HD, but uh, extra uh, 4K resolution. Now, even if we're not playing back or producing a 4K uh, movie, it's actually advantageous to capture in 4K because it gives us the ability to crop, uh, pan left, zoom, uh, straighten an image because we've got pixels to spare. Okay, so if your uh, next camera has 4K recording capability, certainly put that on the tick list of, uh, of useful um, uh, movie capture uh, requirements. Okay, number two is uh, frames per second. Now, most of the, um, the cameras that we're currently buying will have uh, 24 to 30 frames per second capture rate, uh, but some of the cameras now are coming out with higher frame rates, um, starting at 50 frames per second, 60, maybe 100, 120, and some of the, uh, the very latest cameras uh, can have capture rates higher than 240 frames per second. What this does is it gives us the option of playing back uh, liquid smooth slow motion footage uh, and this is uh, quite attractive when we're assembling uh, projects uh, to have that um, capability to slow footage down and still have it uh, running very smoothly. The third uh, requirement is uh, is the bit rate. Now, the higher the bit rate, um, the, the, the more post-production editing we can do before that movie starts to fall apart. Now, a lot of the uh, entry-level cameras can have uh, quite high levels of compression on their movie uh, capture modes. And so what you're typically looking for is, um, is a bit rate that's probably 50 or higher. And this gives us the flexibility to grade the movie uh, maybe uh, do some uh, quite uh, adventurous post-production editing or color correction on that video before we start getting artifacts appearing. Uh, number four is autofocus in movie mode. Uh, a lot of uh, stills cameras, uh, um, especially the DSLRs, uh, when that movie, uh, that mirror flips up out of the way, uh, we're committed to uh, manual focus. Now, manual focus pretty much is the industry standard. Uh, but if you're working as a sole or single operator, having the option to go into autofocus with perhaps face detection uh, is very, very useful when we're recording movies. Okay, number five, um, it's obviously advantageous to um, make movies uh, when the camera is in your hand to be using um, stabilized lenses. But um, the optimum stabilization you're going to get these days is in-body image stabilization, something that um, uh, Sony calls IBIS. Okay, and uh, we're getting up to five axis in-body image stabilization. This helps smooth down any uh, awkward um, camera shake that you might be experiencing. Um, after working for quite a period of time uh, with the camera in your hands. Uh, number six, HDMI output. Can you output the movie as it's recording uh, over your HDMI uh, output uh, onto a separate recording device? This will uh, allow you to uh, not compress the movie, uh, and this gives you the, the greatest flexibility and the highest quality movie output. And finally, um, the, uh, the microphones that we're using inside of the cameras are, are left wanting for professional audio recording. And so typically we're going to use a separate uh, microphone to be recording a higher quality audio. Um, but uh, we'll have an audio in jack on most cameras, but um, not all of the cameras have an audio out. And that audio out allows us to monitor the audio that we're recording through uh, a separate pair of headphones 
users. And so if we've got any um, uh, interference uh, or uh, if the uh, audio is too quiet or too loud, we're quite quickly going to um, notice that and be able to adjust either the position of the microphone, um, etc. Okay, so the camera that I'm currently using uh, for movie recording is Sony's uh, Alpha A7S. This has a full frame sensor, so we can get that very shallow depth of field that we're looking for. Uh, but one of the greatest uh, features about this is um, it's, uh, it's pretty much been designed from the ground up, not as a stills camera, but uh, as, a, as a high quality uh, movie camera. It's got incredible low light um, um, performance. Uh, we can push the ISO really very very high before any noticeable noise appears in the movies and uh, this has led the camera being voted as the best uh, video camera in the professional awards in 2015 those are the Teeper awards okay uh, such as the quality of some of the cameras now appearing especially some of the mirrorless cameras that they're actually being adopted in a high-end industry and it's not necessarily the size of the camera that has attracted them to these cameras it's the sensor size and their ability to record in very low light and uh, some people might think that uh, a price tag of around three thousand dollars is expensive but for the movie industry that's typically um, used to spending over ten thousand uh, for their cameras these are coming in really very cheaply now. Um, there is a movie that you can watch uh, on YouTube. I won't play this one here, but there's a link there that you can follow. And this is a movie recorded uh, using an A7S being picked up by a drone or a quadcopter and recording two cyclists uh, going down a ski slope at the night. And the only light being used to light this uh, scene is moonlight, uh, such as the uh, high capability of this camera in very low ambient light conditions. Okay, so some of the cameras that um, are really kicking goals at the moment are that Sony A7S and the new A7R2 with the IBIS uh, stabilization. Uh, also the Olympus OMD EM5 II, uh, also because of that IBIS in-body image stabilization. Uh, the Panasonic GH4 for its um, uh, 4K recording to the card. And the Samsung just because of its uh, general all-round excellence at recording uh, high quality movies. Okay, uh, you can uh, start um, start recording movies straight away with your DSLR or mirrorless cameras, but quite quickly you'll gravitate to a few uh, added extras that just make your life a little bit easier and give you a little bit more flexibility when recording movies. Uh, first thing to consider is high capacity and high speed memory cards. Uh, typically, uh, memory cards of 64 gigabytes um, will um, re um, give you the plenty of capacity that you need when recording uh, movies at high quality, especially if you're intending to record 4K movies. Um, when you're working with movies, obviously you're going to drain the batteries much, much quicker than when recording stills. So you're always gonna have a couple of um, fully charged spare batteries in your pocket, ready just to um, change over uh, in between clips. Um, obviously, we're not. If we're out on location, we're not going to be uh, trying to transfer all of those uh, memory-intensive movie clips onto maybe a laptop computer. So it's useful to have um, uh, an external drive uh, with a fast in-out port, such as USB 3 or Thunderbolt or even an M SATA drive, that allows us to uh, offload the cards onto an external drive. It's also a quick uh, exchange of information over these faster in outports. Uh, the fourth one is the ND filters, uh, ND for neutral density filters. Um, because we're often recording with the slower shutter speeds in order to create smooth flowing video, um, we're, we're, if we're going to have to um, uh, darken the ambient light if we're wanting both slow shutter speeds and shallow depth of field. Um, otherwise, we're going to be forced into using the higher shutter speeds uh, when we're using wide apertures in bright conditions, and the higher shutter speeds will give quite a, a choppy looking video. And so these neutral density filters uh, are essential uh, for that smoother flowing video. 
And finally, uh, particularly only for the DSLRs here, because most of the high-end mirrorless have electronic viewfinders, uh, which allow us to uh, view the scene that we're recording um, without uh, the um, restrictions of ambient light spoiling the contrast of the LCD panel. And that is a finder for the DSLRs. This is uh, the one in the bottom right-hand corner here. In, the, um, uh, in difficult ambient conditions, um, the, it can be very difficult to work out whether the scene that we're capturing is sharp or not. And so um, one of these finders just helps us uh, both frame the image and also check focus on the video that we're recording. Okay, uh, keeping it smooth. Now, uh, ideally, we're trying to uh, um, keep most of our clips uh, either on a tripod or um, uh, with a, a fluid head or even a monopod or a steady cam rig. But sometimes we have to uh, run and gun, as it's called, and uh, hand hold the camera while shooting movies. Now, typically, what's going to happen in these situations is we're going to get very wobbly or jerky, shaky movie footage. Uh, that's pretty much unusable um, for high quality productions. So we're gonna to have to eventually consider some sort of way of steadying the cam. Now, what we have here is a DSLR on a monopod. Now, the interesting thing about this particular monopod is that it's got um, a, a little um, leg arrangement here with a ball joint, and we also have a fluid head. Now, this gives us uh, the ability to pick up and relocate to um, a shooting a different scene very quickly, and also the ability to pan really uh, in a quite smooth and steady way. If this doesn't give us enough flexibility, uh, we need to basically be uh, uh, walking the camera down a street scene following maybe a character or, or something that's moving in our location, then we're often going to have to consider something like a steady cam or a shoulder rig. Now, you can get uh, very expensive shoulder rigs for DSLRs these days. The one on the left um, uh, coming in at uh, uh, over 1300 Australian dollars. But you can also pick these things up really very cheaply on eBay, uh, just a plastic version uh, for as little as $30. And this is really useful if you've got to walk the camera and uh, also when you're working with a camera over extended periods of time, uh, your hands don't get tired uh, supporting the weight of the camera. Okay, here we have some steady cams. Um, the one on the left uh, retailing at just over $300 for an X-Cam Sabre Mini, uh, which is more than up to the job of uh, holding a, a light DSLR or a mirrorless camera. Or the one on the right, um, it's, uh, these is uh, basically a motorized gimbal setup uh, which gives us three axis uh, stabilization and this gives us uh, a look that's uh, as, as if the camera is on rails as we move that camera down the street uh, removing any sudden movements of the hand uh, as that camera is cradled in those gimbals Okay, and another way of um, creating a small amount of motion inside of um, our scenes is to work with the camera on what's called a slider, okay, or a rail. Um, we can mount the, uh, the rail or slider on a tripod or between two tripods and then uh, simply just push that camera along the rail. Uh, when a scene is static, it's very good to get the camera in a small amount of motion and put something in the foreground um, and uh, so that the foreground moves at a different speed to the background to give us that sense of depth to a clip. And uh, one of the popular manufacturers uh, for this is Dynamic Perception. Okay, and also this uh, this uh, company called Genie uh, that um, uh, that makes uh, a motorized head that can also rotate as the camera is being pushed along one of these sliders. Thank you. Okay, uh, pulling focus. Now, typically when we're recording stills, uh, if the image is not pinned sharp, then often it goes into the outtakes. But in uh, movie making, we often um, pull focus as the, uh, during the duration of the clip. So we might start out of focus and then move into focus or travel through a, a focal plane. Okay, this gives us a little bit more variety in the or creativity in the movie clips that we're creating. Again, a custom uh, 
made rig for your camera is going to uh, cost you uh, uh, quite a lot of money but uh, as you can see on the right we can um, manufacture our own uh, focus uh, pulling systems all we need is something to grip onto um, the focus ring on the lens so that when we're in manual focus uh, we have a greater amount of leverage so we can move that more smoothly and uh, and uh, to give us that smoother uh, flowing uh, focus pull there okay now this is um, a little video that you may want to watch on YouTube uh, created um, um, well it features uh, Philip Bloom uh, he's uh, just um, taken a camera and uh, he's going to um, show us uh, how um, how to set it up for movie capture okay so um, typically um, when we've set up a camera for stills capture the ability to capture in the raw setup um, gives us uh, a lot of flexibility to deal with difficult contrast i.e. we can pull highlights back in post-production when we're recording movies we don't have that flexibility so most um, uh, cinematographers or videographers will often uh, create a picture style just for shooting video and that uh, includes uh, the mirrorless cameras where we can wind out the contrast maybe a little bit of the saturation and sharpness as well uh, and to order to create a small much flatter um, video that we can um, uh, uh, grade in post-production i.e. If, if the image doesn't have enough uh, contrast or the movie doesn't have enough contrast then we can add uh, that contrast in post-production but if a movie clip is too contrasty we, we generally can't lower that contrast we can't pull uh, detail that is missing okay so we, um, take a look at that uh, movie it's certainly very useful information Okay. Alternatively, with some of the, um, the more sophisticated cameras that are allowing us to shoot uh, video now, again, they're essentially stills cameras, but we're getting much more of the sophisticated video features coming in. Uh, for instance, the Sony a7 and um, the a7 II uh, and uh, the a7R II um, are giving us um, the, uh, the video codecs um, and uh, picture profiles that uh, are seen on the much higher, more expensive expensive uh, Sony video cameras uh, we have access for instance to S-Log2 a very flat profile for recording in low ambient light and uh, creating us low um, um, contrast video footage also Canon with its C-Log and Panasonic with its V-Log okay so that's something to look for if you're again shopping for a new camera is uh, looking to see whether uh, we can, we simply just have to wind out the contrast in a in a, in a picture style or whether we've got picture profiles um, set up for a video capture okay a couple of the choices when we're choosing uh, our video settings on um, your DSLRs or mirrorless cameras is you may be given the choice between progressive uh, usually indicated by the letter P or interlaced indicated by the letter I now um, most of the time we do want to lean towards the progressive capture uh, interlaced footage is for broadcast um, and typically um, uh, a lot of broadcast now is progressive and so very rarely do we need to shoot in that interlaced format so um, if in doubt um, default to the P the progressive um, interlaced basically is, a, is an unusual way of um, um, moving the frames forward ie only half of the lines of uh, the next frame are interlaced between the current frame and so each frame isn't um, changing completely we're only seeing half a frame at any one time Okay, the other thing to consider is not only um, uh, 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 frame rate, uh, but also uh, shutter speed. Okay, so um, shutter speed, the pretty much the, um, the most used shutter speed for video capture is a 50th of a second. Um, this is what the uh, Hollywood uses for its 24 frames per second uh, um, film capture. And it's also a very useful um, shutter speed for um, uh, uh, 25 frames per second, which is typically what we tend to record in Europe and uh, Australia and uh, parts of Japan. 
um, whereas America would lean towards the uh, 30 frames uh, per second. Uh, and uh, typically the, uh, the 50th of a second is still a very useful shutter speed. It gives us a nice fluid motion uh, to the uh, video footage. Now, um, this is a, um, a link to a, a video that you can watch uh, created by the slanted lens, which shows you the difference between capturing video with a more normal uh, 50th of a second shutter speed and using something that uh, is fast enough to freeze the subject, but gives uh, uh, for a still image, but gives us a very choppy looking video. Okay, so 50th of a second. Uh, occasionally there are reasons to slow down or speed up from that, but uh, that is typically the standard. And as I said earlier, in situations of very bright ambient light, in order to access that slow shutter speed, we'll often need to put a neutral density filter in front of the lens uh, to reduce the amount of light uh, reaching the sensor. If you're, uh, if you're wondering um, the best um, frames per second for any particular region that you might be visiting, then there are apps you can download for your smartphones. Typically um, 24 frames per second and 30 frames per second, you can pretty much use any shutter speed that you like in the USA without encountering flicking, flickering artificial lights such as tungsten lights or um, uh, uh, fluorescent lights indoors. Um, typically we don't have that safety if we're in Australia or Europe. Uh, we, we can only have that safety net if we adjust the frames per second to 25 or 50 frames per second. And if you're buying a, a, a camera in the US or in Australia or Europe, you'll find that um, the default frames per second choices that we're given uh, often lean towards uh, these particular frame rates. But as soon as we head off overseas, we often need to be aware of the power frequencies of that um, country so we can capture video without flickering um, tungsten lights or fluorescent lights in our video capture. Okay, um, a couple of the um, um, the technicalities of recording video introduces us to some acronyms and some terms that um, stills photographers are unfamiliar with. We're pretty much all familiar as stills photographers to JPEG compression, but um, the video industry uses different types of compression and so uh, different ways of measuring that compression. So we often have to be a little bit um, uh, uh, knowledgeable about these terms uh, so that when we're seeing them in um, uh, spec sheets for new cameras, we know what those uh, specifications are actually referring to. Okay, one, a couple of the terms is uh, codecs and containers, for instance. Um, one of the most popular uh, video codecs now, uh, which gives us a decent amount of compression, um, um, that uh, so we can upload our uh, movies to uh, YouTube or Vimeo quite quickly uh, is H.264, um, but we're not going to see that as the um, as the uh, um, like .jpg. We're not going to see that at the end of the file name because the uh, the file name is is the container uh, that holds that codec, and typically we might be familiar with .mov for movie or .mpeg4, or if you've been used to shooting videos on a Sony or Panasonic cameras, uh, .mts, uh, which is pretty much a container for the older AVCHD uh, codec that Sony and Panasonic were using. Okay, so there is some just some terms that uh, you might want to get your head around as you're moving into uh, video capture. Uh, also, um, compression um, is measured in megabits per second. Uh, as uh, stills photographers, we have the luxury of just knowing whether um, a JPEG compression at three, uh, obviously we're going to start seeing artifacts quite quickly, whereas a video, um, a JPEG compression of 10, we know that's really high quality and we're not going to see any of those JPEG artifacts unless we re-edit that file a number of times. Okay, so generally what we're looking for in, in uh, um, compression um, for our cameras is uh, a high megabits per second. Uh, this will give us a higher quality because it's less compressed. It gives us a larger file size but um, that uh, lower compression gives us the flexibility to post-process, color correct, and grade those videos in our post-production software. 
Now, if you're a Canon user, you're also going to be given some choices whether to go all I or IPB. And uh, generally, all I will give you the higher quality video. And I won't go into the details there what that sort of compression is, but uh, just that all I is the one you would lean towards if you don't need a really small file size. Uh, Sony have just started bringing in the XAVC-S and this is only a, a video codec that's only half the compression of its older AVC HD video so this is definitely one to lean towards if you're buying a new Sony camera. Uh, chroma subsampling, okay, um, generally uh, the luminance and the color values are separated out for different levels of compression. The luminance is less compressed uh, than the color values. Um, now 422 is, is a very good um, uh, set of numbers to aspire to, but most of the time we're lucky if we get 420. But uh, as um, uh, our requirements uh, get through to the manufacturers and they know we want higher quality video in what is essentially still cameras, eventually we'll see chromosome sampling at 422 appearing. Uh, bit depth, again, most video captured in stills cameras uh, is going to be 8-bit, but eventually we'll start seeing 10-bit video appearing in these cameras. So maybe not around or very common yet, but something that we'll probably see uh, just within a few years or so. Okay, so let's uh, move forward and look at another way of increasing the quality of our video capture. Um, not only just um, the way that compression uh, works, such as in the H.264 codec, but also to realize that um, the quality deteriorates uh, the darker the exposure. And so our shadows will tend to have more banding and artifacts uh, down there in the darker values. And so if we are, if we are removing the contrast in our picture style, uh, basically winding out the contrast so we can create a flatter looking video. In situations uh, or in some situations where the, um, the ambient light conditions isn't high contrast, uh, we can um, lean the exposure to the right. Now, if you're working with a mirrorless camera, you may have the luxury of uh, shooting with a live histogram. And uh, certainly if we can lean that histogram over to the right, um, we're going to get a better quality video, uh, the less tonal values we assign to those dark shadows. Now, we will have to expand the contrast out and set a black point and a white point in post-production, but we are going to be rewarded with a higher quality uh, video. Okay, now um, in some of the high-end DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, we will have the option of taking uncompressed video off the cameras via its HDMI port. Uh, but we need a device uh, basically to put that uh, movie footage on. And it's not simply going to be a cheap external drive that we get from our local uh, IT store. We're going to have to buy a specialized um, recording device. Now, the ones that uh, typically work with um, the uh, Sonys will be um, made by Atomos. This is a Shogun that we're seeing in this slide here, a uh, seven inch HD display that can record 4K um, uncompressed video footage coming from uh, the Sony A7S and the Sony A7R2. Okay, so there is another type of video that is out there. It's very uncommon at the moment, especially in the, in the budget end. Uh, but one of the cameras that you will see is uh, what's called the Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera. It comes in at just over 1300 Australian dollars, but it re records what's called raw video. Now, this isn't uh, a raw piece of video, isn't one file. Um, with some magic uh, high dynamic range. It's basically these cameras are shooting um, 24 or 25 frames per second and each one of those frames will be a separate raw image um, and it was recording it in the DNG file format. And so we can um, we have the luxury of a high bit depth and we will be able to recover an extraordinary amount of highlight detail using these type of cameras. In the industry, it's not common to record in the raw file format. They create large files for just short clips, but in very high cost environments, uh, certainly the um, adv advantage of recording in raw is, uh, is enormous. So um, again, something that we might see appearing in more stills cameras as we move forward in time. 
And just because these cameras are small doesn't mean to say that they're not useful to the high-end uh, uh, film industry. Here we have a lens which is uh, uh, advertised as being a lightweight zoom lens, uh, obviously uh, lightweight to stills photographers and to um, videographers is a completely different uh, term. And uh, it's also advertised, I've seen it advertised as a relatively cheap lens at just over $30,000, uh, but it's attached to one of those um, black magic pocket cameras, which is coming in at just $1,300 there. Okay, uh, one of the most important things when we're uh, capturing um, or working on movie projects is not to forget about audio. Okay, and uh, as I will say again, um, the, the microphones in the cameras that we're using are of very um, poor quality. And uh, we basically, we should uh, not, not assign any more quality to these uh, microphones than we would to a pop-up flash on a DSLR. Okay, so very limited um, use. Okay, so we are going to gravitate towards um, purchasing um, a, a specialized um, a microphone. The one you see on the left uh, is a Rode microphone. And you'll see there it's, um, it's in a rubberized cradle, which insulates the shotgun mic from the um, the noise, the mechanical noises of the camera, so that when it's auto-focusing or we're adjusting some of the settings, uh, that isn't passed through to the microphone and then into our video footage. Okay, and that's a shotgun mic that you see in the center there without its uh, wind muff on there, or uh, often referred to as a dead cat if it's a very furry version. And what we have on the right there is a lapel mic. Obviously, the uh, closer we can get the microphone to somebody speaking, uh, the clearer the audio quality and the less ambient noise the microphone is going to pick up. Okay, so the golden rules, um, don't use your inbuilt microphone. Um, uh, invest uh, in one of these um, shotgun mics. Uh, you can pick them up. This is uh, the Rode mic here is the one I use and it's quite a high quality one and uh, will only set you back a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, the other important thing is um, if you can at all um, make sure you've got a camera that can monitor the sound as it's recording. Um, what we're looking at here is the um, the settings on a, on a Sony camera. I've got a, basically a headphone jack and I can also also um, increase or decrease the volume of the microphone as it's recording there. Okay, so the, um, in, a, in a professional um, movie that we might be recording, there are often more than one audio track. Uh, often we might record the dialogue trying to get the microphone as close as possible um, to the subject's uh, mouth. This would ideally would be um, a shotgun microphone on a boom arm or a, a lapel mic. Um, but uh, when we do this, we um, basically remove any atmosphere, atmospheric sounds from our audio track. And so often we tend to put those back in by recording a separate Atmos track with a separate microphone. This will add back in the room noise, wind noise, uh, and some of those sounds that uh, make uh, the sound look uh, natural or, or appear natural. And also then the, the third soundtrack might be Foley. These are the little bumps as a, uh, uh, or noises with a door closing or um, a glass or a cup uh, being placed on a, on a tabletop. Um, and this is uh, typically what we'd experience in a Hollywood set is these three major levels of audio all happening at the same time. Now, often, often if we don't have a chance to record the Atmos and the Foley, then just putting in a music track um, can um, just uh, remove that artificial um, vacuum that we might get without uh, putting the music in there. Okay, now there's um, there's a dead cat, a shotgun mic on a boom pole uh, that we can put near a subject. Obviously, if you don't have that assistant and uh, that boom pole, then the next uh, best thing, or probably even as good, to be honest, is a wireless lapel mic. Um, this is the one that I'm using, which is um, uh, a wireless uh, a mic that uh, the, unit, the shorter unit fits directly on the hot shoe of the camera, and uh, the larger unit uh, um, can be put in a pocket or on a lapel or even on an armband of the subject who's talking. And uh, this uh, adds the audio track directly uh, to the movie that we're recording. 
Okay, uh, this is um, a picture of me with a lapel mic. You can actually see the lapel mic, black lapel mic, black shirt, hardly noticeable to the audience here. And you'll see that even though we're on a pier in a public space, if you were to listen to this movie, uh, there's a little bit of music going on in the background and you hear my voice in a quite clear tone uh, speaking to the audience on YouTube. Okay, if you're working on a real low budget, you can actually make your own lapel mic just using um, the uh, the uh, the earphone speakers and microphone for a smart um, uh, smartphone. Just by cutting the earphones off and leaving the mic by itself, taping it up black, uh, adding a bulldog clip, uh, you can attach it to a lapel, um, put it directly into the audio recording app of your smartphone and put the smartphone in the subject's uh, back pocket. And then that dialogue track can be synchronized uh, with the camera audio in post-production. And uh, there was a movie there, but again, you can look at those uh, cheap uh, hacks, uh, a way of um, avoiding spending large amounts of money on video production on YouTube. Now, uh, if you're wanting even higher quality audio, then uh, it's best not to use the preamps of the camera at all with a shotgun mic, but to invest in an XLR box. Um, the box that you see sitting on this A7S um, has its own um, uh, preamps, and so it's, um, it's not going to uh, fluctuate uh, with quiet and loud noise, um, and we're not going to hear any hissing as the microphone uh, gains up in order when uh, there's a gap in between conversation um, and uh, it also gives us the advantage of using better quality um, microphones with um, bigger jacks um, uh, XLR jacks uh, going directly into the unit that audio can again be fed directly into the movie the hot shoe on that Sony camera is a smart hot shoe and so it can uh, feed the audio from the hot shoe into the movie that's being recorded now, if you don't have one of those cameras that gives you that um, flexibility, then the uh, device on the right at $200 um, is a, a H4N recorder. Uh, the microphones on the top there uh, can record a, a quite a high quality atmospheric track. Um, and we can also plug um, a separate microphone into the side of the unit uh, and giving us both the, um, the um, dialogue of the speaker and the atmosphere at the same time. And then again, we would have to match that up in post-production to the video footage. This is one of the uses of, or perhaps the only use of the microphones in the camera is we'll hear uh, two soundtracks when we take those um, uh, video and audio tracks into um, post-production editing uh, software and we can just match them up. This is often why you hear um, a speaker uh, or the um, videographer clap at the beginning. That clap will give you a quite a large spike on the, on the, um, the graph that we're looking at in um, the post-production software and allow us to uh, align those very accurately so uh, we can basically um, get the dialogue in um, lip sync with the person speaking. Okay, so um, as I said, you can pick these up. Uh, for what they do, these are, are not that expensive. Again, $200 giving you really a very professional audio quality. Okay, now if you're looking for music um, to add to your um, uh, section, it's very useful if you know a musician, but um, there's plenty of Creative Commons music out there. And uh, if you're not uh, trying to make uh, money from the video projects that you're creating, you're just using them as promotional videos, then there's certainly a lot of Creative Commons music out there. And this is uh, just a few of them uh, that you might uh, gravitate towards in order to create a little library of music that fits the sort of video projects that you're making. And uh, there's some useful links. Um, uh, the, uh, the first one is uh, Vincent Lafouré. He uh, moved from stills photography into very high-end movie capture. 
um, and uh, he's a sharer so anything that he's learnt along the way um, he uh, basically uh, posts on his blog. Our next one is Philip Bloom okay um, a videographer that worked for the BBC um, is very comfortable with stills uh, cameras and moving cameras and again he shares what he's learnt about that transition and also some tips and techniques for working with uh, DSLRs and mirrorless cameras shooting high quality video. Um, in uh, post-production and also maybe uh, video terminology, let's uh, take a look at David Kong first. He's, uh, he's a great one to um, uh, get you up to speed with s some of the um, tech uh, terms that uh, is, um, we might be unfamiliar with as stills photographers. And he teaches you in quite a lot more depth than I've been talking today about things like compression and codecs, etc. Um, Jeff Singstack I've put in there as somebody who might give you an inroad into using something like Premiere Pro to edit and assemble your video projects together. And uh, this slide deck that I've been using today uh, with links that are live um, can be downloaded from my Adobe Creative Cloud account um, from this link here that I've got. Okay, so um, thank you for um, um, bearing with me as I've uh, taken you through this journey, this uh, transition that often many stills photographers uh, make as, we're, um, as we explore the creative possibilities of moving image as well as still uh, image making. And uh, good luck in your journey. Uh, join me online at either markgaylor.com or look for me on Facebook, Mark Gaylor Photography, and uh, shoot me a message or a question um, or any feedback um, that you might want to share with the photography community. Okay, thanks and goodbye.